The Lynx is our suborbital vehicle program. We've been working on the suborbital vehicles uh, in one sense or another now since 1999. Different people have different opinions about where the market's going to go, but our opinion was that the price point that we needed to hit to make enough money to make the whole program worthwhile was low enough that we couldn't do it without sort of gas and go rocket propulsion, that we could uh, turn the vehicle around with a very small number of maintenance man hours and consumables dollars per flight and fly it a lot. That problem has been more or less behind us for a number of years now, and the focus has shifted more and more and more to the aircraft itself or the, the spacecraft or the vehicle. There's no universal terminology for this stuff, the thing. The current configuration clicked into place when we switched to a slightly staggered side-by-side -side cockpit configuration. That got rid of an integration problem that had bedeviled us for a long time, where if you put the people tandem, the cockpit gets too long and the nose gets too far forward to the center of gravity of the ship. And when you put them side by side, the cockpit gets too fat and it doesn't fit the LOX tank anymore. So we staggered them at sort of an F-111, as uh, Rick told us the first time he saw it. So that just looks like an F-111 cockpit. So thanks for telling us now after we beat our heads against the wall for a while. The result of the, the, the kind of funny looking World War II canopy look is uh, one of those little things that can come back and bite you if you're not careful. Although the initial part of the flight test program, we can use plastic windows. Uh, when you get to the higher Mach numbers, especially for satellite launch missions, the windows get too toasty for plastic. And yes, you can order curved transparencies and all kinds of high temperature glass, but if you're not careful, the transparency is gonna cost more than the rest of the vehicle. So by going to the faceted panel, you can buy cheap transparencies uh, that are only going to cost a few thousand dollars instead of costing many tens or hundred thousand plus dollars. That's not the pressure hole. That's just the outer transparency. The pressure hole is a curved uh, plastic transparency on, that's on the inside of that window. The three markets, as I mentioned, of the vehicle are uh, people, payloads, and upper stages. All three market segments show signs of being a whole lot larger than I thought they were gonna be 10 years ago. I was gonna be perfectly happy if, the, if there were a few hundred passengers per year at our price point. Several studies out there and a lot of the early market adoption data suggesting that it might be more like thousands. I was gonna be very happy if there were 50 or so payloads a year uh, for microgravity and astronomical research payload purposes. We've already got one customer who wants more than 50 payloads a year and the upper stage missions, the nanosatellite launchers, we could put about 10 kilograms up by putting an expendable stage on the back and carrying it up to release and stage outside the atmosphere. Um, and that'll be a roughly half million dollar price point in quantity one. Cirrus Design's Vision SJ50 single engine personal jet offers exceptional fuel efficiency, flexible seating for up to seven, advanced avionics, and all the Cirrus safety features you expect including the Cirrus Airframe Parachute System. With its V-tail design, the Cirrus Vision is technologically advanced, yet engineered to be simple to fly, to allow owner pilots more lifestyle pursuits than any other personal aircraft. Learn more about the Vision SJ50 at cirrusdesign.com. One of the recent activities that we've been up to is we finally got into our first wind tunnel test. Uh, for years, I've uh, been curious about the relative merits of, of CFD and wind tunnel testing and uh, certainly had hoped to do the vehicle largely as a, a CFD-derived vehicle. And now that we've been through our first round of wind tunnel testing, I ain't never building the vehicle without a wind tunnel again. So that's the wind tunnel model that we uh, built with all the various uh, control surfaces that we, we screw on a different control surface for each different uh, control surface deflection. This is the configuration history of Lynx from the beginnings of the configuration to today. Starting in the upper left corner was our first configuration, the kind of duckbill nose. That nose is an extremely important part of how to make the aerodynamics of the vehicle work. It's really one of the keys to the whole system, but it, it helps maintain the, the trim over the desired range of angle of attack over the range of Mach numbers that we go through. Uh, the vertical stabilizers were something we were also doing a lot of work on. Over the last year, we changed from the R1 configuration to the R2 configuration to mitigate some uh, high angle of attacks, flow separation issues. But again, I show this just to give you some insight into the process that we're going through, which gives you some, kind, some set of idea when I talk about we're still refining the aerodynamic design. I don't mean we're talking about tails in the front, tails in the back. We're talking about very small aerodynamic configuration refinements. 
We uh, recently pulled the first uh, real piece of hardware off of real tooling, which is a real thrill for me after so many years of working on the vehicle design on the computer to see real pieces of it coming together in the shop. The wings and the fuselage of the vehicle are just like a whole bunch of other composite airplanes that have been out there. But the cockpit's pressurized with a fairly high pressure differential and it's got big transparencies and it's the first time we've done this configuration and it's got the control mixer in it and, 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 and. Um, so there's a lot of structural detailing, exactly where do you, and, and it interplays with the people and the human factors of the cockpit. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. As you can see, it's fairly small. It just seats two, the pilot and the spaceflight participant or his corresponding payload. There's no tower, there's no launch infrastructure. We put the, the propellant in out of trucks. That also means it's something we can base fairly flexibly, and there's certainly some applications that would call for us to do that. This is something we've done with all of our vehicles. We exploit the reusability of the engines to do a hot fire checkout before every flight. It is amazing how many problems you find in advance of flight that way. This is a very high thrust to weight vehicle. Uh, we use an 8,000 foot runway, but most of that's for stopping in case you have to. We actually take off at about 1,800 feet, uh, climb out fairly steeply. Uh, by about 60 seconds after engine light, you're supersonic going up at about a 50 degree flight path angle. Uh, total burn time for the full performance mission is about three minutes. And then once you uh, finish managing cutoff, you coast up ballistically. Depending on whether you're talking to the Mark I or Mark II, you get either you know, 90 seconds or several minutes uh, outside of the sensible atmosphere. And you get that time to enjoy the view and the sensation of being where so few have gone before. I can't wait to try it. Then you, the vehicle re-enters aerodynamically. Uh, we come in at about 35 to 40 degrees angle of attack. And then as the G's build up, you point the nose down to manage the G's, uh, sort of X-15 style reentry technology. By no means is the Lynx the end of the road. You know, the Mark I uh, will be the prototype. It'll be the first tail number. And it's built out of materials that are easier for us to field modify than the Mark II will be. That's really the primary difference. Uh, because we know the Mark I is guaranteed to find issues in flight test that call for us to make some tweaks to the airframe shape, uh, we want to make it out of stuff that's easy for us to tweak. And unfortunately, we do not yet know of a material system that is easily field modifiable and easy to make field joints on, and it takes the temperatures necessary for a 350,000 foot reentry. Uh, we can do one or the other, but we can't do both. So we're going to make the first one out of ordinary aerospace graphite epoxy materials. Uh, we'll do all the field joints on it, and then once we have all that flight test program behind us and we have the shape completely frozen, we can build the second airframe out of the higher temperature materials, and that's the reason why there's a Mark I and a Mark II.